Welcome everyone. I'm Dr. John White, the Chief Medical Officer at WebMD, and you're watching Your Health on Tech. What if I could diagnose your health conditions just by listening to your voice? Sound far-fetched? It may not be. Joining me to help explain what we're learning about the relationship between our voices and our health is Dr. Yael Bensusim. She is the director of the University of South Florida Health Voice Center. Dr. Bensusim, thanks for joining me. Hi, thank you so much for the invitation. You've been studying how the voice and our health are related. And you're working on a study that I find fascinating. And you said to the doctors, close your eyes when a patient comes in. And just by listening to their voice, do you have an idea about the diagnosis? This is a, a very big project. Uh, my co-principal co investigator is Dr. Olivier Lamento at Cornell, and we have a team of 10 institutions with um, 45 to 50 investigators on that project. So really a large scale project. Um, and, and what's interesting is that we find that we know and we've known for a very, very long time that voice can give um, biomarkers of certain diseases. And, and you know that because, you know, when, when your friend calls you, for example, you can tell if he's feeling sad, you can tell if he sounds sick. You know, a lot of time we hear, oh, you sound, you don't sound like you're well. And, and that's just from the sound of the voice. Um, the, the interesting part is, is when we talk to doctors to, to find out what disease to study, that's really when we ask them, well, close your eyes, listen to the voice, can you tell? And that's when we ask experts about the disease we think that could be a diagnosed with voices. Some of them are intuitive. What I do is voice disorders. Uh, so obviously for voice disorders, when I close my eyes and I listen to voices, um, I hear different types of voice disorders, uh, like uh, cancers of the voice box, like neurological um, conditions called spasmodic dysphonia, for example. But there's other ones that are less intuitive. Um, so for example, my, my co-PI spoke to one of the oncologists uh, at, at Cornell, and he said, well, you know, I think I can hear when people have brain metastasis from lung cancer when they, when they come to see me, and, and those are less intuitive. And, and obviously, you know, um, it's always nicer to say, well, just by the voice, but really in terms of the science, um, we're, we're going into multimodal data integration. You know, when we speak about artificial intelligence in the future, uh, what's going to be really important is not single modality, so not just the voice, but really taking the voice um, with other integration of other modality. It can become, you know, people say it could become like another um, heart rate or another, another blood pressure. What's the pathophysiology of a voice disorder that's signaling perhaps there's something else going on in the body? So that's a great question. So I just to make it clear, we're not talking about, you know, specifically diagnosis pancreatic cancer with voice here. Um, what's interesting is that we looked back at the science um, and looked at what was proven or what was um, in the terms of pilot studies and diseases. And we found really find five categories of diseases. So when you think about voice disorders, that's intuitive. When when your, your vocal cords change, right, that's the first thing that changes. If, if there's a disease on your vocal cords, then the sound of your voice will change. That's the first thing that changes. The science is easier. Uh, when we talk about neurological disorders, for example, uh, like Parkinson's, Parkinson's, Parkinson's is an example. Mm -hmm. um, ALS, you know, people have neurodegenerative disorders. These are people who have changes in speech and in voice. When we go back to neurological disorders, um, we know, for example, somebody having a stroke, that what you say changes, right? Sometimes they tell you on TV, um, if if your speech is slurred, you know, go to the doctor. So those are those are things that we've known for a long time. This is not new. Parkinson's, same thing for people who know um, that they work with, with Parkinson's disease patients, uh, they can recognize the voice of a, of a Parkinson's uh, patient. But, but you're collecting 30,000 voices to analyze. 
that's the goal over four years. And that's really the most important thing for, you know, artificial intelligence is a great technology. We know that the technology is there. Um, machine learning is very advanced. Algorithms are very advanced. What we're missing is really the data. Um, and that's the most important because we know that to train these algorithms, if you don't have accurate data in large quantity, then your, your algorithms are just not generalizable. That's really the, the goal of our big project. And that's why so many people are involved. And, and it's important for us to keep it within academic institution is to get the quality and the accuracy of the diagnosis, uh, as well as the quantity. Will I just talk into my smartphone and it'll analyze my voice? Is that what? what's coming? Well, that's the goal. The goal is really to make something, a technology that's accessible. And, and a lot of, you know, startups are looking at this already and are making you give, donate your voice to, through your phone. Um, what's different here is that, first of all, we need to make the experiments to make sure that the quality is, is good enough through a phone, you know, and maybe for different type of diseases, the quality you need is different. Uh, maybe for uh, Parkinson's or for Alzheimer's, you can give your voice through your phone because it's really the content that's important, the content of the speech. But maybe for diseases like cough um, that, you know, can have different etiologies or causes, maybe you need a better microphone, maybe you need a digital stethoscope uh, to have the accuracy that you need to diagnose this. So this is really what our teams are, are working on this year is, is looking at what is the minimal quality we need. But obviously the goal for public health is to have something accessible, not in an doctor's office with high technology, but really to uh, remote populations. Well, you say this technology ultimately could be a bridge to provide access to those in rural and underserved communities. Everybody says that, though, for every technology that we talk about. You think this one will be different if we know that it works? The goal is not to replace doctors and the, the, the goal is not to replace experts. Um, you know, there are experts in every categories of diseases that we were studying. There are experts in the field. If you go to the expert, then you'll get a diagnosis that's probably, you know, as good or better than, than, than the technology. Um, what's important is to provide the same expertise to people that don't necessarily have it. So when we think about family doctors, you go to your family doctor, your voice changed, you know, often they don't have the tools to look into your voice box. They don't have the tools to do a CT scan. They don't have uh, in their offices. Um, and that's why the voice can help. Um, and, you know, you would be speaking through your phone, for example, and the, the app could say, well, there's a really high chance this is a voice box cancer based on all the data that we've seen and that we've analyzed with our algorithms. This patient should be sent to an ENT fast, you know, um, versus I see people in my practice, unfortunately, that come really late with very advanced voice box cancers. Uh, they were told it was a cold or laryngitis or reflux. And, and not because they're bad physicians, just because they don't have the tools and it takes time to see an expert, you know, that's really the goal is really the, the screening earlier, not, not necessarily diagnosis where, you know, you, you will not, won't have to go to the, the doctor. That's not what we're trying to, to develop. We're trying to help physician with better screening tools. What I love about this, Dr. Ben Susan, is you're talking about the power of voice, yet as physicians, we're known to interrupt patients after just a few minutes. We tend to do most of the talking and we don't really listen to them. Do you think this might resensitize clinicians actually listening to their patients? In my clinic, uh, I often make the patient repeat the story for me. Then I have my students come in and I say, listen to what they're going to say, you know, and, and, and listen to the cues in their voice. Uh, so this in my practice is, is uh, very intuitive. Again, um, I'm really hoping, you know, I think, I think in medicine, we really need to listen to patients. I think, listen to what they say, listen to how they say it. Um, and, and I always teach my medical student that a good clinical history is worth uh, a, a million CT scans. What tips, if any, do you have for viewers that even now could maybe be on the lookout for certain changes in voice of loved ones, of spouses, of children, of elderly parents that might trigger the idea, hey, maybe you might need to see a doctor. Well, I would say listen to your friends and families. Uh, I often see people in my in my office who say, well, my wife 
told me that my voice changed. So I'm here. Uh, sometimes people listen to a change in their voice or with some diseases that are more neurological, you know, people don't necessarily realize. So they'll tell me, well, my friends are telling me that, that I speak differently, you know, that my speech is slurred. Um, so when people give you that feedback, that's really the time to, to come and see and see your physician. Um, I hear my voice is tired. Uh, you know, I, I see a lot of people and they're like, well, my, my voice is not as strong. The voice can tell a lot about your health in general. Um, um, and it's not necessarily, you know, it doesn't mean that your vocal cords are injured. It could mean a lot about it, your, your whole body system. The power of voice relating to our overall health. Fascinating research. Dr. Ben Susan, I want to thank you for all the work that you're doing here and sharing it with us today. We look forward to following it. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.